Well, folks, let's begin this morning by thinking of a familiar phrase. Let's think of its origins this morning in a speech that was given in Cape Town, South Africa, back in June of 1966. Robert Kennedy, who would be shot to death two years later to the day, he would say these words. There's a Chinese curse which says, may you live in interesting times. Well, like it or not, we are living in interesting times, he said. These are times of danger and uncertainty. Let's so remember, he'd already lost his brother three years before. His words would turn out to be more prophetic than, than he would ever know. And although his words were determined to not probably be of ancient Chinese origins. They are nevertheless, I think, still very profoundly useful for us this morning. For just as Robert Kennedy, who died 50 years roughly ago now, so do we, don't we, live in very interesting times. These are interesting times politically and, and socially and nationally and, and, and internationally. And, and we could say this for a lot of different reasons. In fact, if I were to ask each of you to take out a little piece of paper and to jot down three reasons why these are interesting times and you were to give them all back to me, I would, would read off literally dozens of different reasons why these are interesting times. You know, when I was Growing up back in the 60s and early 70s, I suppose like a lot of boys, I liked reading comic books. So, so last weekend, my wife Cindy and I, after church for a little R&R, &R, we went down to the incredibly inexpensive Moore's Theater in South Haven. And there we saw the new blockbuster Marvel Comics film, Black Panther otherwise you know, known to his comic fans as T'Challa, the Black Panther, is essentially an African prince who moonlights as a superhero. Did, 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 did you know that? Well, not to give away too much of the movie's plot, I guess you could say that the film writers wanted you to come away with a message. The message is build bridges, not walls. Yeah, we live in interesting times, don't we? Years ago, I, I became familiar with a book that came out written by an author named Robert Putman called Bowling Alone. And I think the title is kind of appropriate for this whole Winter Olympiad series because, you know, after all, curling is an Olympic sport. So I thought, you know, hey, bowling, you know, that's something we do indoors during the winter a lot of times. So, so why not, could bowling be an Olympic sport as well? Maybe, maybe I'll try to see if it can be introduced to the next Olympics. So Putman, who is a, a Harvard Poli Sci professor, back at the turn of the millennium, in the year 2000, writes this national best-selling book. Bowling alone. And I want you to listen to what one of his reviewers had to say about his book. He writes, Once we bowled in leagues, usually after work, but no longer. Well, this seemingly small phenomenon, it symbolizes a significant social shift. Drawing upon compelling data that reveals America's changing behaviors, Putnam reveals that we have become increasingly disconnected from one another. He says that our social structures, whether they be the PTA or, or the church or political parties, are disintegrating. And so Putnam, this reviewer writes, has not only deftly diagnosed the harm that these broken bonds have wreaked in our physical and civic health as a nation, but he's identified the essential power of these bonds in creating a society that is happy and healthy and safe. 
Folks, again, let's remember that this book was written back in the year 2000, before 9-11, before the world that we live in today. And certainly, we see the evidences of these broken bonds and bridges all around us as we build more and more walls that divide us. We see it in the shootings and, and I think as well the, the bombings that have seemingly become almost an everyday events in our culture. And in each instance, isn't it the case that often the source of these tragedies, it, it ties back to the feeling of alienation on the part of those individuals in question. Yeah, somehow they, 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 they feel disconnected from society. Metaphorically, they are what? They are bowling alone. We see it in the, in the growing divide between people in our country of different races and, and sexes and religions and ideologies. We, we become a very angry people. Like Rodney King said so memorably back during the L.A. race riots in that spring of 92, can we all just, what? Get along. Apparently not. Yeah, we live in interesting times. We see it in the growing divide between nations. We, we definitely are seeing more wall building and saber rattling than we are bridge building. And aren't we seeing it more and more and more in the church as well? Yeah, if folks don't like something, then they just take their toys and, and they go home. Much of our sense of community is being lost. And so in his book, Bowling Alone, Robert Putnam includes a chapter on religious participation. And this is what he says. Faith communities in which people worship together are arguably the single most important repository of social capital in America. What is social capital, you ask? Putnam defines it as the connections or the bonds that bind us together. And he actually first traces this term to an article that was written, get this, 102 years ago now by a state supervisor of rural schools in West Virginia who when urging the importance of community involvement for successful schools had this to say 102 years ago. Social capital refers to those tangible substances that count for most in the daily lives of people. Namely, goodwill, fellowship, sympathy, and social intercourse. For an individual is left helpless socially if left to themselves. But if they come into contact with a neighbor, and then they with other neighbors, then there will be an accumulation of social capital, which is to say, the community as a whole will not only benefit by the cooperation of all its parts, but the individual will as well. Find in these connections the hope, the sympathy, and the fellowship of their neighbors. However, folks, Putnam goes on to chronicle then how in the 60s and the 70s, the religious habits of the baby boomers, that generation began to shift away from, from things that were more of a community faith perspective to more of a privatized faith. Where Christians are believers, yes, but not necessarily belongers. And as a result, an emphasis was, was placed not on as much a shared faith and a belonging to a particular faith community, but more and more and more on, on surfing from church to church, which, which puts more of a focus on one's own greater personal fulfillments and a consumer's demand for the quest for the ideal self. Yeah, translated... Many Christians are now bowling 
alone. Because in a culture where people are increasingly cocooning, you've heard that t term, and staying home, where all kinds of businesses are, are closing because, heck, why come out and shop if I can just Amazon Prime my purchases online? And sure, why do I need to go to a video store and rub elbows and shoulders with other people when I can just live stream everything right at home? And why do I need to get, all, get up and get all dressed and drive and come out to church when I can just stay home and watch Joel Osteen or Charles Stanley in my jammies? Right? And yet despite all this cocooning and, and bowling alone, isn't the, the principle the same as those studies that show that people, when they exercise, they exercise the best when they do it together with somebody else? Folks, during our, our Winter Olympiad series, we've had some visitors during the sermon each week, and this week, being uh, no different, we, we begin to see a lone runner enter into our midst. Here they come now, down the aisle. And as they run, the proverbial race of faith set before them, yeah, they're, they're running alone, but they seem to do pretty well. But sort of like that old Beatles song, the, the race of faith is a long and winding road. It's more of a marathon than a sprint, isn't it? So eventually, running alone becomes wearisome and, 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 and drudgerous. So our runner begins to struggle by going off the path into paths perhaps they should not be going on. They grow weary and heavy laden with the toils of the trail and they begin to, to catch up with them and, and, and they want to give up. Yeah, the, the trail of faith ain't easy when trying to go it alone. And uh, yet look, we notice that along comes a couple of other runners on the trail of faith. And they come up alongside of our other jogger for Jesus. And they begin running with him. And now running together, we begin to see that our original runner, when he tries to veer off course and lose focus, that his fellow traveling buddies are there to keep him on the straight and narrow. And when our original runner grows weary from the journey, the other two are able to encourage him and, and to keep him keeping on in the faith. In fact, I mean, it's sort of like wise old Solomon says to us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If they fall down, they can help each other up, but pity those who fall and have no one to help them up. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Yeah, it's sort of like that scientific principle in nature we call synergy. The sum of the total parts is greater than their individual worth. Our runners are better running together than they could ever be by themselves. And so folks, let's give a round of applause to our <laughs> joggers for Jesus as they <laughs> run off. You know, this synergy or working together that we're talking about, that's the sense I got from an interview I heard from Jessie Diggins. You may recall back during the Olympics, she was the first gold medal, any medal in the Olympics, won by a cross-country skier from America. Very inspiring. And she shared how that all happened. It used to be that the regimen, the training for the Olympics for cross-country skiers in America was long and, and lonely training. But they decided they needed to train together as a team. And they spent a lot of time together in community. Synergy uh, apparently made all the difference in the world in their results a gold medal. And I think that brings us, folks, to an issue 
that I would like for us to discuss this morning in the midst of the difficulties and the interesting times in which we as Christians are now living as we run this race set before us. Yeah, if running together is much better for us, then why do Christians tend to skip church and stay away from other believers when we get discouraged? Well, one reason is perhaps that we get embarrassed that we're still struggling with problems that, that we think should have been conquered years ago. Yeah, we don't, we don't want anyone to know we're still wrestling with that same old issue. So we disappear from sight, and as a result, we, we grow even more discouraged. But that's exactly why we need each other's synergistic strength. And that's what the writer of Hebrews, I think, was, was trying to say to some fellow faith runners who were growing weary during the long trail of faith. Yeah, church attendance, it was, it was declining back then because of the inevitable trials that they were facing on the trail of faith. And so the writer said, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds and not forsaking the fellowshipping of the saints together as some are in the habit of doing. Well, folks, you know, we begin each week um, before we get into our Greek word by getting back into that Olympic spirit, by, by remembering the ancient Greeks. And as we get back into that uh, Olympic spirit, once again, let's hear our very Olympic-sounding music. So when the writer of Hebrews is talking here in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 about making sure that we are not forsaking the assembling of ourselves one another as is the habit of some who apparently are not fellowshipping together, that word forsake, it's taken from the Greek word, you can see it over here, and it's a whopper. Eg kata kai pontes. Wow, what a word. It comes from three Greek words. Eg, which means out. Kata means down. And the third, lipo, which means behind. So when we put them together, they literally mean out, down, and behind. Or to put it in another way, this person was discouraged, defeated, and depressed. Out, down, and behind. And maybe they were feeling depressed because it looked like everyone else was running a better race of faith than they were. They were lagging behind. They were towards the, the back of, of the faith pack. Or perhaps this is someone who was, who was feeling weary from having to run such a long race of faith that God was calling them to. They had faced so many potholes and bumps and unexpected detours along the trail of faith. But regardless of the reason why, this word, it describes a person who feels left out. They're down and, and they're depressed and, and they feel left far behind everybody else. And you know what? The moment people begin to feel like they're failing and like they're falling short of everyone else, that's often the moment that the enemy begins to whisper into their ear and says, oh, just stay home from church today. Uh, you, you don't need to go down there with all those rejoicing people after all. You know that you don't feel like being with them today, so why not just go home and be by yourself? You don't need them. You can read your Bible on your own. You know, it says in 1 Peter 5.8 that our enemy... The devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for his prey to devour. So resist him, 
standing firm in the faith because you know that your brethren in the faith throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. Remember when this happened to old Elijah, the prophet? Back in 1 Kings in your Old Testaments, there he sat. He was all alone and and, and depressed. Talk about a, a race of faith. Elijah had just outran on foot King Ahab's chariot. A distance of 17 miles. And then let's remember that He's just defeated King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's 850 false prophets in this battle royale up on Mount Carmel. Then he runs this two-thirds of a marathon, and now as he sits utterly exhausted, he then receives word that Queen Jezebel is after his hide. So he then proceeds to run another 100-plus miles to the top of another mountain called Horeb. The race has been long, it's been been grueling, and Elijah is on the run from his enemies, and the perfect storm for depression is setting in. Elijah has exhausted and depleted his resources. He's suffering from the sort of combat fatigue, and so he just wants to give in and, and, and die. And yet remember, What I told you a moment ago, the devil prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for his prey to devour. What's the tactic of the lion out there on the Serengeti as he lies on the edge of the weeds? Sure, he looks for the old and the young and the sick and the weak, the easy targets. That's what Elijah had become all by himself. He was disillusioned. His perspective was distorted. He felt down and out and behind. And yet it was then that the still small voice of the Holy Spirit spoke to him in the midst of the winds and the earthquakes and the fires of life and spoke to him encouragingly, just as Peter did for those New Testament saints, those faith runners, The Holy Spirit reminds Elijah that he was not alone, that there were 7,000 other faithful believers in Israel who had not bowed the knee to idols, and that Elijah needed to get back up and, and get in the race with these other believers again. We assume that's what he did. Yeah, stand firm. You're you're not alone, Elijah. Run with your pack. Yeah, Satan knows that if he can get you to fall out of fellowship with other believers that that you're supposed to be running with, and particularly in the very moment when you need fellowship and encouragement the most, then he can probably keep you down and defeated. Yeah, it's true. You can just read my Bible at home and watch the TV preachers on my couch. But fellowship with other believers is essential for a vital Christian faith because you receive encouragement in the church by being with other believers that you cannot receive anywhere else. In fact, that's why the church is the last place that the enemy wants you to be when you're feeling low. It's why the devil works overtime to try to tempt you to skip church and stay home and do something else instead. And that leads us to our second Greek word for today. Yeah, once again, Hebrews 10, 25 reminds us, and let us not forsake our assembling together as is the habit of son, but let us encourage one another. And dear ones, that word encourage or exhort is a powerful little Greek word, parakaleo. Again, it's a compound of two words, para meaning alongside, and kaleo, which means to call or to beckon to someone. So when we put these two words together, they depict someone who comes right alongside of us and urges us, who beseeches us, who calls us to make the correct decision. 
You see, in the ancient Greek world, the word parakaleo sort of described um, a military leader who would call their troops to battle. But rather than hide them from the painful realities of the war that they were facing, the general, he would summon his troops together and would speak plainly to them about the potential dangers of the battlefield as well as the glories of the victory that, that awaited them. And that way, rather than glossing over all of the very real dangers of the battle, a general would come right alongside his troops. He would encourage and exhort them to stand tall, to throw their shoulders back, to look their enemy right in the eye, and to face their battles courageously. And you know what? Just as the writer of Hebrews said to his troops, yeah, walking by faith these days, doing the will of God, it will sometimes place us in the midst of the fray of the spiritual battle. And sometimes these, these battles aren't won quickly. It's wearying, it's, it's tiring, and so... If you know someone who's discouraged and falling behind and growing weary in the race set before them, then let me exhort you to gently come alongside of that person and to speak truthfully in a straightforward way, the way an officer and a gentleman would speak to their troops. Yeah like the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside of us, paraclete, coming from the same root word as parakaleo. So we are called, as Hebrews 10 reminds us to, yah, yah, spur one another on. Yeah, the, the, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, just as he did with Elijah, by, by reminding him, coming alongside and saying, that there are several thousand others who have stood firm in the faith and the battle and the strife. So our battle general, the Holy Spirit, comes alongside of us and recalls to our mind the sweetness of the victory when the battle, the race, will someday be won. And he calls us to do the same. There are other fellow runners along the trail, fellow saints who need to hear a passionate, a heartfelt word of exhortation as we jog up alongside of them. In fact, perhaps that word exhort in Hebrews 10 could be better translated. You know, when you're, when you're feeling down and out, like a failure who's falling behind. Don't stray <laughs> away from your fellow faith runners like some seem to be doing, but, but rather bond together synergistically and cheer each other on so that you can run that tough road of faith which lays ahead. Friend, do you know someone who is bowling alone, who's trying to run the race all by their lonesome. Perhaps they are becoming an easy target for the enemy. Perhaps they are running low on social capital, on the bonds of encouragement which keeps us in the race. Well, if so, then rather than letting the day slip by, why not this week turn your earthly minutes into eternal moments by taking the time this week to call that individual and encourage them or get together with them for coffee? And if you, if you can't do that, then how about writing them a note and help them refocus on the victory that lies before them if they will just keep running with the pack? Yeah, come alongside them and, and nudge them back on the course. Run beside them as an accountability partner, as a cheerleader, determined today 
to be a comrade to a fellow Christian soldier. Make it your aim to speak words of encouragement to those around you. In fact, if you see someone who's discouraged and falling behind in the race, then go out of your way to make sure that no one gets left behind as we run the race of faith that is set before us. So I'm going to ask you to take out your little white sheet if you don't already have it out. And inside you'll find on the back the little prayer, my prayer for week six that we've been praying at the conclusion of each week. And let's pray this prayer together and then throughout the week you can pray it daily. Pray with me. Lord, when I grow weary and tired of the faith race set before me, or I become tempted to stray from the path, when I feel like I'm falling behind and I want to give up, surround me with other fellow faith runners who can encourage me to keep running. Yes, give me the focus to attach myself to a band of other believers who will spur me on in my faith. And even more, Help me to be that exhorter, that encourager for other strugglers along the trail of faith. Through a note, a phone call, or a cup of coffee, let me cheer another on so that together we might win the victory. Amen.